Okay, and there's Dave. Very good. So I'm recording. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, host of uh, the Forest Connect webinar series, which is part of the broader extension and applied research um, initiative of Forest Connect. And we're joined today by an exceptionally good speaker we've had several times before, Dave Apsley. Dave and I go back, I calculated it, <laughs> like 35 years. Probably. And Dave and I were at Purdue University together. Dave was my uh, undergraduate dendrology TA, so all of my tree ID I know because of Dave. So, and Don Leopold. And Don Leopold, I'd say. Don Leopold, Leopold, right. He, that, he had some influence on that as well. <laughs> so anyway, Dave's going to be uh, talking with us today about, is it time to harvest your timber? So I appreciate Dave, you joining us. I'm going to mute my microphone and turn it over to Dave. So welcome, Dave. Dave. And welcome, everyone. Thanks, Pete. Um, I want to start out by letting folks know that I encourage you to chat during this thing. And I've asked Pete to relay some of those chats while I'm talking if I don't see the chats. But if you've got questions as we go through the process, I'll try to answer them. And then we'll see if we can get our slides to advance here. So is it time to harvest your timber and how do you know? I just want to give you a little greetings from southeastern Ohio. I'm actually in Jackson, Ohio, which is in the southern part of the state. And since a lot of folks are on here from the Northeast, I thought I'd give you just a little overview of Ohio and our forests. Um, as you can see, most of the forest in Ohio is in the Eastern and Southern part of the state. This is pretty much the unglaciated portion of the state. And down here, we've got a couple counties that are almost 80% forest. And then the rest of Ohio looks like what you'd expect Ohio to look like. This Northern glaciated portion has counties that are as low as 5% forest. And then the big star, of course, is Columbus, where our main campus is. Um, again, I work for Ohio State University Extension. So how do you decide? Is your timber ready to harvest? Well, one of the things you need to take into account is landowner objectives. What's the condition of the forest? What's the value of the trees out there? How big are they? What kind of quality do we have? Are the risks involved? Examples of risks that we're seeing in Ohio are timber theft. And then this little guy, which has pretty much uh, done its thing in Ohio, but folks in the audience in the chat window, can anybody tell you, tell me what's going on with this tree in this little hole? Any guesses what's going on? Here's another hint. Yeah, it's emerald ash borer. Um, it's pretty much run its course in Ohio. We still have some trees that are standing um, that are not dead from emerald ash borer, but certainly um, that's a risk um, and it's something that can trigger a timber harvest. But we always tell people don't, you know, especially if the woods is not heavily dominated by ash, don't let that drive your management. Um, certainly if you've got ash in the woods and emerald ash borer is imminent, then it's something to consider. What's going on with markets is something else we need to think about. Is your timber mature? But preferably, and in Ohio, I'm not as familiar with New England, but a lot of timber harvests are initiated by a knock on the door from a potential buyer. And that's what we want to avoid. We want folks to be informed and educated, and we don't want them to make that rash, quick decision when it comes to harvesting timber. When you look at, again, these are Ohio statistics, but when you look at why folks own woodlands and what are their main reasons for owning woodlands, look where timber is down here. It's, it's down fairly low on the list. Most folks own woodlands because they like to be in the woods. Um, just the beauty of it, they like to observe. Some folks like to hunt wildlife. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons to own woodlands, but timber is not usually the highest or one of the higher ones. But what we're finding with statistics that a lot more folks end up harvesting timber than say that timber is an important reasons for own, reason for owning the woodlands. So we want to make sure that if you do decide to do a harvest that it's somewhat compatible with your objectives. And what usually drives that is, is financial concerns, but sometimes it, it is that knock on the door. That person answers the knock and talks to someone and finds out, hey, there's a lot of value out there I didn't realize was out there, and they make that quick decision. So my first really biggest piece of advice is know what you have. 
a lot of folks sell timber because they get a knock on the door and they really don't know what they're selling. And a good analogy to that, if, if it's a farmer, say a cattle farmer, how many folks would sell cattle, actually let the buyer go out and pick what they want, give them whatever they decide they want and not even tell you what they took, or you don't even know how many cows they took or what the quality of the cows that are, they took. And as you know, if it's their choice, they're probably going to take the high quality and leave you with the calls or the low quality. So knowing what you have, you know, what's out there, what's the species makeup, how much volume do you have out there, what's it worth? That's all important to, to know. And I went the wrong way. So a good inventory is really needed for a forest management plan too, and we can't emphasize enough why a forest management plan is important. But if you wanna make progress in your woodlands, creating a forest management planning, following it will get you there a lot quicker. It helps you identify what resources are out there, not only for timber, but also for the other reasons that you own your woodlands. Helps evaluate the condition of the forest so you can catch things that are going on like emerald ash borer. Um, maybe your woods is unhealthy for other reasons. Maybe there's been a big onslaught. In Ohio, we've had a lot of uh, poplar weevil and we've got some pretty major damage to yellow poplar. And normally it's not a big concern, but historically, in the last few years, we've lost some trees due to it. Also, how crowded is it? Are there forest health issues? Those are all things you need to evaluate your woods for. Another reason to have an inventory done is to determine your basis for tax purposes. If you buy a piece of property that has timber on it, you paid something for that timber. And, and determine your basis is a way to, to calculate what you paid for that timber. And when you sell timber, it's usually by capital gains is how you're taxed. And so if you have a timber basis, you can actually reduce your tax burden because you're paying taxes on the net, not the gross. And if you can document what you paid for the timber at the time of purchase or the time you acquired it, it can save you quite a bit in taxes. You can also look at how the trees are doing, what the growth rates are. If you wanna be scientific about your management, you can even term, determine your growth, growth rates and the rates of return on the investment and timber can be a really good investment. And then it also helps you decide that your trees are mature or if they're mature. The question is what's mature? And we'll get into this discussion as we go through the, the talk. At least an inventory should really help you set some realistic goals for your woodland. And this is an old image that I, I had to work at to get. Um, my mentor, when I came into Extension in Ohio about 18, 19 years ago, Randy Heiligman, always had this slide in his carousel back in the 35 millimeter slide days. And I always thought it was a little goofy initially, but his argument for putting this slide in there is that woodland owners say that timber and income is not a major reason for owning their woodlands but they don't have a clue what their timber's worth. So without that knowledge, how do you make that decision and set your, your goals and objectives? The other argument to know what timber is worth is even if you're not planning on selling it, it's good to have an idea. Um, if you get the knock on the door, you know if it's a reasonable offer, you know if it's not. If you end up having to sell the land or some timber for financial reasons, you have an idea what you've got out there. So I think that's really important as well. And then it gives you that baseline. That inventory tells you where you are, and then you can monitor that progress. It's awful quiet out there. Is everybody hearing me? It's kind of tough standing here talking to your computer and not seeing an audience and people out there. So just checking in with folks. So the information that we really need with an inventory are things like age and size distribution, what species are out there, What's the site quality like? How about the health and vigor of the trees? Are they growing well? Are they mature? How crowded is it? What's the value, the current value? These are things that we really only need at the harvest time, the actual, actual numbers, but good estimates are important as well. We can uh, calculate growth rates by using an increment core. If you're a landowner and you're patient, you can also mark those trees, put a paint dot on them or uh, put a mark on them and then get a diameter tape and measure them frequently and do a sampling that way to see what's going on. 
the other piece of advice, and uh, this is kind of foreign to a lot of woodland owners, but I, I think it will make sense once I describe a little bit more. That is divide your property or work with your forester to divide it into stands. So many times people make management decisions on their whole property. And that may make sense on a small property, but this property in the image is actually 30 acres. And you can see I've got three different color schemes going on here with a, a fourth, this little swamp or wetland area. But this is an oak hickory forest. This piece of woodlands is more, uh, more maple dominated with yellow poplar in it. And then this is a Virginia pine stand. So it makes sense that we would manage those differently. A lot of people, when they do a timber harvest, allow that logger to uh, harvest on the whole property. And, and it makes sense to inventory by the stands. Got a question about drones to evaluate one's forest. Um, I'm not into that technology yet. I wish I had that capability. Um, I think there could be some ability to do some work with drones. Uh, historically, we do a lot with aerial imagery. Um, we used to use old aerial photos, but now we've got imagery available. Um, so I'm sure that drone could help give you a little more detailed information than you could get from some of that traditional imagery. But all a stand is is a group of trees that has a similar age distribution, site quality, species mix, and this is really our management unit. The analogy I like to use is um, a farm field. You know, if it's a farmer and you're in this hill country in Ohio, you're going to treat your bottomland areas. Historically, in this part of Ohio, some of the folks put tobacco in those bottoms uh, to the rolling areas that maybe you would have hay in. Um, if you've got large bottom bottomland fields you might grow corn and soybeans in them and then on the steeper hillside might be your pasture or be left in forest so you're going to treat the forest differently depending on that past land use and what the topography looks like also mentioned age distribution um, it's really important to know what kind of stand you have in ohio and southern ohio we've had a lot of historic disturbance and most of our forests are somewhat even aged our overstory is dominated by oak and hickory, and we may have a second story developing under it, which is more shade tolerant like maple. Um, so that's an even age stand, and if we start taking trees out of the canopy, we're gonna get a different result than we've got in the canopy. Versus this is not a very good image, but it's supposed to represent like what a sugar maple stand would look like that had maples in the canopy, and the regen under it is maple too, because the maple can regenerate in its own shape. Things like site index or site quality are important too. You know, how, what's the capability of that site of producing trees? And all site indexes are just these curves developed based on the heights of trees. And in this part of the world, how tall they typically would get at age 50. So a, a site that grows trees to 40 feet at age 50 is a lot less capability than, the same, than a site that could grow trees to 100 feet at age 50 but we can also get a lot of that site quality information from the hill country just based on topography, based on what direction the slope faces, how high up you are on the ridges. The ridges around here are much drier. The southern and western aspects or facing slopes are, are also dry, but as we get to the north and down the bottoms, we've got different capabilities. Another thing you really need to know is your crown condition. This is a 50 year old tree that's struggling along because it's too crowded. Um, it's a black oak, it's about 50 years old when I took the image. This is a black oak about 50 years old on the same site, but it had a little more space around it. So do most of your trees look like that or do they look like that? That's important to know when you do that inventory. And then are they mature? This is a kind of an example of a, a monster tree that I can see in all the old aerial photos on my properties from the 50s, but it's, a, it's what we call a wolf tree or a remnant tree that's been around a long time, probably about 40 inches in diameter. And then how crowded is it? Um, that really, there are a couple factors that tell you how crowded it is, actually the size of the trees and how many there are. And the school bus is a great analogy. That school bus that can hold 55, first graders pretty comfortably um, isn't super crowded when it's got 55 first graders in it. But if it's got 55 adults in it, then it could be a different crowding. So it takes into account the size and the number of trees out there. And we usually calculate that on a square feet per acre. 
And then stocking is really relative to what we're trying to manage for. Um, and I always use the analogy of Goldilocks. Um, we're looking for a certain stocking. Too many trees, it's too crowded. The trees don't grow well and some actually start dying. Too few trees, we often can't meet our goals and objectives. And this looks way too scientific, but just to show you that if we have an idea how big the trees are, the sum of the, the surface area or the cross-sectional area of those trees and how many we have, we can actually determine where we are on this chart and determine if a cut makes sense or not. And then of course, for a timber sale, we need things like the diameter of the tree, how much of the height is usable. We usually estimate how much they taper and we figure out, okay, based on some tables, how much are we gonna lose when we run that saw through it and do the slabs that are slabbed off the edge to get an estimate of how much volume is out there. And in this part of Ohio, we typically use Doyle log rule, which is really not super accurate. Um, it works really well on the larger trees, but on the smaller trees, it tends to underestimate. And a lot of folks really worry about that. I really don't worry about which log rule folks use and if we make it a competitive process. And we'll talk about that as we go with the timber sale. And then the quality of those trees is important to know. And we'll get to that a little bit later. So now we have an inventory. Is it time to harvest? That's the question. And of course the answer is, it depends. Are your trees mature? And that depends on how we define maturity. These are some tables um, based, based mostly on silvics of North American trees, but we've also got some other publications out there. And you can see some of these trees can live a long time. Actually the silvics of North America publication, I think underestimates quite a bit. But you look at what's biologically mature for say white oak, three to two to 300 years. Um, so what's biologically mature just means how long can a tree live in nature. But there's also another definition, and this comes from Mike Jacobson over at uh, Penn State Extension, and they've got a wonderful pub. Um, this pub called Forest Finance 8, To Cut or Not to Cut, is a wonderful publication. But if you look at that, they talk about the biological maximum. That's when the trees mature and when it gets to that point, it starts to slow up and actually go backwards and starts to die. But there's also a financial option. So if timber's your major goal, there's a thing that we could shoot for called financial maturity. And that's based on alternate rate of return. If you were to harvest the trees, invest the money, are the trees growing at a rate that's a better investment than actually harvesting the trees at that point in time? And you can see that that occurs much earlier in the life of a tree. So those are the two major maturity um, definitions that we typically talk about. Most landowners probably aren't managing for optimal financial maturity, but they probably don't want to get to the point where the trees are starting to go downhill and they're starting to get major losses either. It's an old publication that's still out there. It's uh, Financial Maturity. It was produced by Randy Heiligman, and it's available on uh, OSU's websites. Um, I should, let me just type it in here. Um, the best place to find our publications are at this site. And I just stuck that in the chat window. So that's a good website. If you go there and click on publications in Forest, you're going to find this pub. Gets into the real detailed calculations if you're a mathematician and you like to do that stuff. So here's some basics of tree value. As a tree increases in diameter and height, they increase in volume and value. Pretty common sense. The bigger it is, the more wood's there. Very common sense stuff. As the DBH or diameter at breast height increases, oftentimes the usable height can increase as well. So that adds to the volume that's out there and saleable. A big thing that I think a lot of people lose out on, and we'll, we'll focus in on this more later, but as the diameter increases, the value of the product that can be produced can also increase quite a bit. So the board foot value can go up. And this is where a lot of people I think miss an opportunity if they harvest too soon. 
Tree grade and tree quality are diameter dependent. You cannot get veneer out of a 10 inch tree. Um, it's just too small and doesn't meet their guidelines. And as you can see, uh, really the capability of sites varies. Um, but as if you've got a low quality site, this site index 60, um, you're going to peak out quicker than on, on a high quality site. Um, so again, what size we're looking at varies a lot depending on your sites. Some other things, I just threw this in because I, th I thought was really important. It can't, comes again from some of Heiligman's work. But if the butt long, I got a typo in there, that should be butt log, will increase in grade prior to the harvest, it is not financially mature. So if you're cutting a tree that could potentially increase in grade or quality, it's not mature and you really should wait. If trees are really big, their earning power is less because there's already value there and it's hard to add value to those trees. High quality trees also have a lower um, earning power. But again, if you can increase in quality, you can really increase the earning power of that tree. If you can increase the growth rate, you can increase the earning power. So there's a big argument for doing some management, things like crop tree management on a younger stand or some uh, timber stand improvement to get the growth rates up a little bit, you're gonna increase your return on your investment. And these aren't quite as critical, but um, merchantable height does play a role. And if they're taller, they're gonna produce a little bit more. If you're managing your woods and you're doing a pre-commercial or actually doing a harvest, some things to think about too are there are certain trees that you should probably remove because they're kind of dragging your productivity down. Calls or near calls, trees that have no value and have no potential to have value should probably be removed. Again, depending on your landowner objectives, they may provide other benefits. So you need to take that into consideration. If they've got decay and rot, they're not going to increase in value. Probably makes sense to get them out if timber is your major objective. Slow growing trees, trees with poor grade, um, and then short lived species. They're taking up space. They probably won't make it to the harvest. Then leaving them in the woods doesn't gain you much when it comes to timber and timber income. So those are things you should consider removing. So now back to Mike Jacobson's publication. And again, I highly recommend finding the, a copy of this because it's a great publication. But I love this graphic. In Ohio, a lot of timber harvests happen when we have a thing called a diameter limit cut, which means a logger comes out or a timber buyer comes out and they only harvest trees of a certain size, over a certain size. Uh, it's kind of curious though, the big trees over that size that have no quality s seem to stay around. So if you're at this 16 inch class and, and we always talk about diameter at four and a half feet above the ground, but let's say they happen to be talking out on the stump and we're down here. If we're harvesting here, we're losing this, all this potential on some of our trees to bring a lot more value. And the best way to show this is this graphic, again, from the same publication. And they use an example of a 12-inch black cherry in Pennsylvania. That 12-inch diameter tree is um, worth about 60 cents a board foot. So these numbers are prices per thousand board foot. So $602 per thousand board foot or is uh, 60 cents per board foot. So that 12-inch tree using the Doyle Law Gruel would have about 59 board feet in it. And its value at the time is $35. Not a super high value tree. If you look up here, a little more info, the tree's growing at seven rings, has seven rings per inch. So in seven years, it grows about two inches in diameter. Great, I noticed Pete um, put the link to the pub. That's awesome. So in another seven years, that tree is gonna be almost twice as big volume wise so it's worth twice as much money so you know in that case it's probably worth waiting but look at what happens in the next seven years when it increases in volume again doubling so if we just increase in value based on volume it should be around 135 dollars but look it more than doubled that 
that almost a five-fold increase. Why is that? Why did that tree, it only doubled in volume, but about a five-fold increase in value? And the answer's right up here. That cherry's worth more because they can make a more valuable product out of it and will pay more for it. And if you carry it forward another seven years, it, it doesn't even come close to doubling in volume again, but the value more than doubled again is because it jumped into a, a higher class of value. So if you go back to this picture, it's jumping into these higher quality products. And so there's a better return on that investment. To carry that a little further, if you look at the math behind it and the rates of return, you're getting a really good rate of return on just growing that tree, that small tree to a little bit bigger. It's about a 5% rate of return. But if you're managing your forest well and holding on to those trees and allowing them to get more valuable, you can get some pretty phenomenal rates of return, much more than most of the investments we're going to get, the alternative investments. And then if you really are into the math and you're an economist, um, there's actually tables in there and I'm not going to go through this, but you can actually do calculations on your, your uh, financial rate of return on your woods. And again, this is all from the Jacobson pub. So why is tree grade so important? It really is common sense. I mean, prime uh, logs are going to bring quite a bit more. This is a, a dollar to two dollars and fifty cents a board foot in Ohio for walnut, which is a statewide average from a couple of years ago, um, versus number one, number two, and then blocking logs. So the 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 price uh, or the grade or the quality makes a big difference in price. Another great fact sheet that's uh, available through OSU at that. Woodland Stewards webpage that I showed you earlier by Eric McConnell talking about log and tree grade. And I just wanted to point out that to meet certain grades, you have to be a certain size diameter, minimum diameter 16 for the lower grades, it's smaller. And then the usable length and how clear it is, how many defects there are, are the other major factors. If you're interested in timber prices, I stumbled across this site and it seems to be pretty good. Um, you can actually go to this website. Um, the address is here at the top of the page. Click in your state and it'll, it'll uh, give you hot links to the sources of timber prices. So if you're interested in knowing uh, what timber prices are uh, in your area and what the trends are, that's a great place to go. Got a question. Any thoughts about having a professional for forester do a periodic analysis on the forest value or multiple forest products? Um, yeah, I think it's good to, to have that value determined by a forester. I'm not sure how often you would need to do it. Um, you can do some calculations based on growth. If you know what you've got out there, you could apply the, the numbers to that um, and probably wouldn't have to have it, you know, it on a real regular basis unless something major has changed. Um, can you share that link in the chat box? I'm not sure if I can copy that link from here or not. So I'm going to um, probably add it later is what I do, unless Pete can work some magic in the background there for me. I'm typing it in. All right. I figured you would. Thanks, Pete. So what's this all mean for you? <laughs> and uh, unfortunately for most woodland owners, it means absolutely nothing because they don't get a competitive price for their timber. They just sell it to the knock on the door. They don't get a real competitive price. And so it doesn't matter what the price trends are. If it's not competitive and they're not getting top dollar for it, then it doesn't mean a whole lot. And then the other big thing, if you don't do the harvest right um, and it compromises your objectives, then your whole reason for owning that woodland is turned upside down. So that again, we're going to talk quite a bit later about why a forester is important to help you with the harvest. It all comes back to why you own the woodlands. Is it maximum timber income? If it is, then get that forester involved, regularly evaluate your woods, find out what it's worth. If it's not, it's still good to know this value and know what your potential is. And you know, if you own more than a few acres of woodlands, it can be a way to generate income to make other improvements on the forest or to meet some of your other financial needs. 
And a lot of times a timber harvest is very compatible with other landowner objectives. For instance, hunting, you can improve some woodland wildlife habitat considerably by doing some timber harvesting. But really importantly is working with that professional forester to develop a plan that matches your goals. And then if a harvest makes sense as part of that plan, then you want to implement one. So when you do decide to harvest, just some pointers for you. First of all, mark all the trees to be harvested. It's really important to make sure that trees that are to be harvested are marked. The only exceptions may be if you're selling low value products, small diameter things for pulpwood, for instance, or firewood, maybe not. But if it's a, it's a hardwood we're dealing with, trees should be marked. You should follow those uh, markets. Know what you got out there. Know what things are trending hot. Um, and if the prices are up, then, you know, it may make sense to move your harvest forward a little bit um, to take advantage of some of that. Avoid high grading and diameter limit cuts. And I made a little edit to that in the process. Avoid high grading, diameter limit cuts, and select cuts. And you can see me put up the quotes. Uh, select cut is what I hear a lot. That's a term that a lot of landowners use. And I'll get those calls as an extension forester. They said, I want to do a timber harvest, but I only want to select cut. And a selection harvest is a term that we use in forestry, but it's different than a select cut. For most people, a select cut is whoever's buying selects what they want to harvest. So the criteria is, does it pay its way out of the woods? And that shouldn't be the criteria necessarily for you as a landowner. So that's something I'd highly avoid. And when the topic of a select cut comes up and I get the question, is a select cut better than a clear cut? I always say, depends who's doing the selection or the selecting. So be careful with that term select cut. It means totally different things to different people. Also when you're harvesting, getting rid of some of those lower quality trees and making room for those future trees that are gonna be more valuable down the road, uh, get that done as part of the harvest. And then we've mentioned already, don't remove trees before they reach their grade potential because you're losing the potential to make a lot more money down the road. Also, make sure that logger is well-trained and protects those residual trees, especially during that felling process and that they can directionally fell. I've been in woods where the timber harvest is going on and all this nice future forest is damaged because the the sawyer is just sloppy and they damage a lot of the trees when they're when they're dropping other trees a good well-trained logger who can directionally fell can avoid most of that you can't always avoid all of it but they can avoid most of it you can also do a lot of damage from skidding so designing skid trails where the bigger better quality trees for the future are, are avoided and the trees that are going to get damaged are lower quality trees or trees that are going to come out anyway Follow best management practices to prevent soil loss and site product productivity loss. Um, there's so much damage that can be done by logging under poor conditions and not following best management practices. So those are things that we highly recommend. Make the process competitive. Get bidders out there. Find a way to get them out there. And what we really recommend is mark and inventory all the trees you're selling, make a list. It's no different than an auction, having a sale bill that gets mailed out to potential buyers so they know what you're selling and then have it, make it a competitive process. We'll talk a little bit more about that before we close too. Avoid selling on shares. Again, another edit, don't sell on shares. There's some things that can go wrong with selling on shares. I've got another slide on that, but that's basically the buyer gets a percentage the seller gets a percentage. And that percentage in Ohio is probably most commonly about 50%. So why don't we wanna sell on shares? What's a fair percentage? And I always like to use the analogy, let's say we got a 30 inch diameter sycamore that is 20 feet to the first limb. And it may be worth a few bucks. It may be actually negative value because nobody will buy it. A 30 inch diameter walnut at the same height may be worth a couple thousand dollars or more in Ohio. So a logger is gonna get 50% of a $40 tree, the sycamore, and 50% of a $3,000 tree for the same amount of work. To cut it, fell it, and get it to the landings, the same cost. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So that percentage really should change with the quality of the tree, and it normally does not. There's lots of things that can go wrong with selling on shares. Let's say you've got a perfectly good buyer, um, trustworthy, but they go out of business before you ever get paid. Um, there's also some tax liability. If you're selling on shares, you're really a partner in the venture, so you may not qualify for capital gains, probably wouldn't. And there could be some liability issues if there's a logger injured on the job or a truck wreck on the way to the mill. Um, you, you're considered a partner in that venture, at least in most places. So that's something you want to be careful with. A lot can go wrong. And we mentioned the tax implications. So in most cases in Ohio, we highly recommend a lump sum sealed bid sale. So we mark the trees, we advertise it, we give the buy potential buyers a chance to look at the timber and then they submit a sealed bid. And then the landowner has the right to reject any and all bids. So you might have a top bid from a logger that may, maybe you don't like the reputation so much and you've seen their jobs, you've seen their work, they're gonna offer a little bit more money, but you just don't wanna deal with it. You could take the next lower bid. So that's what, in most cases, we highly recommend as, sale, as, as a way to sell timber, and we highly recommend staying away from selling on shares, even though that by far is the most common way that timber's sold in Ohio. Again, remember to protect your residual trees from felling and skidding damage. I actually went through those. Let's put this one. And then consider the forest regeneration and invasive plants. So at the time of that harvest, <coughs> we could create some potential problems. One is if we don't have the regeneration we need on the ground at the time of harvest, we may not have a desirable future for us. And the other is invasive plants. And we'll talk about both of those in just a little bit of detail. So for regeneration in Ohio, one of the things we're looking at is oak. So I'm gonna use that as an example. And this is a slide I actually used the last time I did a webinar, webinar on Forest Connect. I put up this bullet, cut and pray rarely works. And about a month later, I gave the presentation in front of a live audience in Kentucky. And in the back row, there was a Franciscan monk kind of staring me down when I put this bullet up. But for most of us, cut and pray doesn't work. If we want oak regen, we've got to actively manage for it. So we've got to look at those seedlings before and after good acorn crops. Um, we've got to do treatments to get those seedlings well established. And this image doesn't show it very well, but we want these oak seedlings to develop big tap roots. So we've got to get some light to the forest floor by, in a lot of cases, removing the midstory, which we're using prescribed fire, we're using herbicides. In, in this part of Ohio, it's mainly red maple that's blocking the light to the forest floor. And with that layer of maple in there, we're gonna regenerate red maple. And then we do a harvest called a shelterwood typically where we remove about half of the canopy, get some more light to the forest floor. And then if we do it right and wait long enough, we can get this sea of oak regeneration here that we can then with another harvest, um, get them established. Um, the key is with that shelter wood, it's a partial overstory removal. And what we're leaving are high quality oaks um, that are going to produce the seed uh, for the future for us. So um, it's a different way of looking at a harvest. For invasive plants, a timber harvest creates a vegetation and a, a void in the soil. It disturbs the soil. And if you've got invasives there in Ohio, it's not uncommon to have multiflora rows. And in a heavy shade, it's really not much of a problem. But we get light to it, it'll expand and become really competitive again. We've got other non natives that'll fill in these voids as well. And then wind, birds, and other animals can introduce new plants into those voids because we've got more light on the forest floor. Um, and then additional species can be brought in. This picture is Japanese stilt grass. Um, logging equipment is notorious for bringing in stilt grass. So if you're having a timber harvest done, um, some of my counterparts in Ohio aren't real happy when I tell them this, but I highly recommend that equipment gets cleaned uh, before it comes on board because if there's soil in the tracks of that dozer, then there's a pretty good chance you're gonna bring in Japanese stilt grass or other non-native invasive plants. You can also bring in non-native invasive plants in seed 
mulch for your logging roads and even gravel. In Ohio, we've got a tree that's pretty commonly invasive called Alanthus or tree of heaven. And if you look at gravel pits, they're always growing around them, it seems like. So that seed is going into that gravel and getting hauled onto the, onto the property. And again, in your contract, consider having invasives addressed. But I highly recommend going out prior to the harvest, doing control, doing these things to prevent, bringing new um, invasives in, and then do some follow-up. When you start seeing invasives pop in a year or two after the harvest, then start treating them before they get out of control. So in Ohio, we have a program called Call Before You Cut, um, and several other states are involved, but um, this is specific to Ohio But if in these states. But if, if you're thinking about a harvest, reach out to folks like Peter at Cornell or your, his counterpart in other states or your DNR folks to get help with that harvest. Um, CallBeforeYouCut.com, you can actually go to Ohio and order a packet of information either online or by this 800 number that gives you just some good information on how to harvest timber. And the little tagline you can't read here is uh, woodlands grow or healthy woodlands grow on good advice and getting that good advice from an uh, experienced professional is really important. And with that, I kind of wrap things up and we, I think we're doing all right on time. Aren't we Pete? We still have, what, another 18 minutes? Yep, so that's good. So I really recommend hiring a consulting forester to help you with a harvest. They're gonna help you design the harvest to meet your objectives. They can mark the trees to be harvested and market those and help advertise it. They can focus and they typically will help you focus on the trees that are left. We're looking at what's left and what's the future for us going to look like instead of that buyer who's really looking at what has value today. They're going to help advertise and uh, make the bid bidding process competitive. They also understand forest regeneration and invasive plants and other things so they can help you avoid some of those problems or minimize them. Really important, we haven't talked about, but contracts are super important. You want a contract developed that's gonna protect you. You want a contract that a, a experienced forester helps to write and a lawyer is involved with. Um, a good consultant's also gonna monitor that sale periodically as it's going on to catch things before they get out of control. It's too wet to shut down the logging operation so you don't get some of those major problems. They can help you protect your forest, your wildlife, and so on, and even lessen the visual impact if that's a concern. If the harvest is viewable from, say, your home, um, there's some things they can do to help with that. From my experience, I get a lot less calls from folks, <laughs> landowners who are using consultants who are unsatisfied than I do with those that don't. So a lot of times folks have a harvest, you know, they do the handshake, they have a very minimal contract, and then they're not happy with the result. So um, using a consulting forester is a way to make that experience more satisfactory and frankly, uh, usually more financially beneficial for you as a landowner. Oops. In Ohio, here's our directory of foresters. Every state has a, a way to go about it. The Society of American Foresters is a great place to go to look for a forester. In Ohio, legally, you can call yourself a forester, make yourself a business card and not have any credentials. So we developed this through the Society of American Foresters as a site where everybody on the list is a member of the Society of American Foresters. So they have a forestry degree. And this is just a way to give credentials to those folks that are out there doing that work. And I've actually noticed a couple of names on the list of attendees today who are consultants here in Ohio. So with that, we've got about 15 minutes. That went a little quicker than I thought. So I'd be glad to entertain questions. Great you see job, anything in the Dave. chat window yeah, I've missed there? One. I just, that was uh, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. That. So Andrew shared maybe more of a comment, um, but as of, rather than a question, he says some states have tax incentive programs for landowners to retain woodland as timberland, and they require a 10-year interval for management. Mm -hmm. Any thought? You're, this was 
uh, there's some conversation about how often might a forester come in and right and visit with the landowner. So that was just like yeah. Reference. So in that case, those management plans very well may be maintained. You know, and the person helping you with that might be your state service foresters, what we call them in Ohio. Um, so certainly that makes sense. And those tax incentive programs can make a big difference um, financially for you as a woodland owner, too. Mm -hmm. in, in New York, the state reviews the plans, but it, it's a private sector forester that has to write the plan if it's part of that tax incentive. Yeah. Larry wants to know if you can talk about the mill tally option for selling logs when the when the rate per thousand is predetermined. So we have an agreement with a buyer or a logger that says, okay, um, you know, the walnut's going to go for this much a thousand and the sycamore is going to go for this much a thousand. Um, so it's not quite shares and it's not quite lump sum, but it's a predetermined uh, rate of reimbursement to the owner. And I'm, I'm not sure the best way to address that, to be honest with the, if Larry can respond, are you talking about the landowner actually harvesting them and then hauling the logs in or having a contractor? Do well, that? Uh, good question. So Larry can <laughs> clarify that. I was assuming that this was the landowner was at arm's length from the actual harvest and contractor yeah the, and so that. the contractor either the buyer at, who is the contractor or the mill who then brings in a contractor right. uh you know has a predetermined rate yeah and i'm not sure the best way to answer that pete you're welcome to pitch in if you want but in my general experience i still think the lump sum sale is the way to go because it's competitive and you're not locked into the one mill um, whereas you've got this competitive process, you're probably going to come out better. But again, that's going to vary depending on the quality of the product that you're selling. Um, I do, I guess I'd agree with that. I mean, if you can, if you can go lump sum, I agree. That's probably the best bet The the challenge that I would see with the mill tally is that, you know, so you get a log and who determines the grade of that log. So is it a number two? Is it a select? Is it right. whatever? Um, so there'd have to, you know, and you could work that out in a contract, but those are, if you're going to go that path, you need to think about all of those decision points and yeah. who's going to make the decisions and what. even the log rule they're using can make a huge difference yeah. on yeah. the yield. I mean, it yeah. could be half or double. Right. Um, so you're still, unless you're that real exception of landowners who does understand the quality the grade and can get the the volume estimates um you're still at a major disadvantage if you're working directly and you don't have someone in the middle that's kind of representing you and that's what i really recommend in most cases mm -hmm. so elaine says um we asked about foresters people have used and we were very happy with the outcome so that's reinforcement for your recommendation to use a forester don wants to know how does a forester get paid? Well, it, the probably the standard way, there's two potential ways, but the standard way is a commission on the sale. Um, there's a percentage of the sale, probably the average in Ohio is around 10%, depending on quality and the bit size of the sale. So there's a bit of an incentive there for them to market the product that they're selling. There could also be incentive to cut some trees that, um, may may not be ready to cut but for most consultants i think um, that's the way to go some do get paid on an hourly rate i know a few consultants that offer it both ways and say we'll calculate it both ways and and uh you know do whatever's cheapest for the landowner so but normally it's a percentage of the sale the thing i didn't mention with lump sum sales too is that we typically recommend that the landowners paid a percentage at the time of the bid opening and an in full before the trees ever leave the site. So that's another big piece of protection for the landowner. So Dave Jackson, I'm guessing that's Dave Jackson from Pennsylvania. Hey, yeah. Yep. Hey Dave. Hey Dave. Uh, how does the call before you cut work? Where does the call go? Who answers? You showed a map with several States. Can uh -huh. other States join? And the answer to that is the first part is it depends and it varies by state in Ohio. The 800 number goes to DNR 
Um, gentleman, um, Don Karras, it's usually a live line during regular business hours. He'll take the call. And mainly what they do currently is um, basically send a packet of information with a lot of what we talked about today and uh, send that out to the landowner. If the landowner requested online through the Ohio page, then I get those requests too and I can answer questions. Um, Ohio's in the process of shifting and I think the goal is to have once they get a request from a landowner that's thinking about a harvest, you know, with more than an acre or two of land that's really thinking about doing a harvest, they're actually going to try to be more responsive to those calls and make them a priority and send a service forester out to provide advice as well. Missouri actually has an agreement with some consultants in the state and they pay the consultants to go out and do an assessment and to, to intervene and work with that landowner. And then they write up a little report too. So every state's a little different. Um, Minnesota, I believe it goes to the Woodland Owner Association and I'm not sure how they deal with it. So it's mainly a marketing thing. We just provide educational materials through it in Ohio. Missouri's really ramped that up and I'm really envious of what they're doing because I think that's that makes a lot of sense. What I failed to mention is a harvest can be really good for your woods. But if you do it wrong and you don't have a professional helping you with it, it can set your woods back for centuries and you can't recover from that very quickly. So it's, it's a real important time to get a professional on the ground to make sure you do it right. Okay. And so can other states join? They can. I'm not driving the train on that. It's actually our division of forestry. I just got a call from another state this morning. Um, we're in that process of kind of trying to ramp things up and improve call before you cut. It's getting a little stale, frankly. Um, so yes, if you're from a state that's interested in joining, get a hold of me and I can hook you up and we can have a discussion with our state uh, division of forestry to, to get some other states on board. Okay. But one more piece to that. It is managed in Ohio. So the original web page is here. And then if you want to join, we can actually provide a, a sub page where you can do what you want with it, either follow our template or create your own or whatever. So it's really not that difficult. We also have folders that are standardized that give basic information about harvesting timber that you can customize for your state to mail out information in. Okay. So Abigail, probably when we were talking about the mill rate, talked about that being a pay by scale, which is often, I'm guessing, I'm, I mean, I'm inferring a lot here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then often works with softwood is pay by ton. So those are some other options for payments. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark wants to know how does selling timber affect CAUV tax value of land in Ohio? Okay. In Ohio, we have a tax program mainly designed for agriculture called current ag use value, CAUV. And there is a forestry component. So in most, it's administered a little differently in every county, but most counties want you to show active management and a harvest is a way to show active management. Preferably you're doing it according to the management plan, but um, that's actually a way to show active management to stay in the program. Okay, Tom wants to know if you have or can suggest a sample timber sale contract for people who are interested in selling timber? In Ohio, I don't like to do that. I've actually talked to our legal people at OSU Extension and they really said, don't do it. We don't recommend a sample contract. If you go to that Woodland Stewards page, we have a fact sheet. It's a bit older, but it lists the things that should be in a contract, but we don't like to just provide a sample contract. For the very reason a lot of people are going to take that scratch it out, put their names on it and use it. And what we recommend is working with a professional to develop a contract for your situation. And every landowner, every situation is a little different. So um, yeah, if you can find a sample contract and there may be someone in your state that can provide it, but just use it with caution, use it as an example of things that ought to be in a contract, but then have one developed specifically for your property. And that's, I agree, it, uh, every contract should be customized. Cornell has one on the internet. Um, and if you just do a Google search for sample timber sale contracts, you can find examples. The concern, as Dave said, is that people don't think. They just 
change the names. Um, and the other downside of that that I've seen is that they end up including a lot of clauses and constraints that increase the amount of work uh, mm -hmm. for the logger, maybe unnecessarily relative to the owner's objectives. And then each of those constraints means that there's less money paid to the landowner. So yeah. constraints are good, but only the right constraints are good. Right. Okay. Um, I see the one from Larry. I think I can address okay. Larry's yep. question about is lump sum is based on the estimate of the forester. Usually with a lump sum sale, the trees are marked. The forester does come up with an estimate, but you're given potential buyers the chance to walk that property and estimate it on their own. Um, foresters usually are fairly conservative in the estimate, but what really drives the price is those potential buyers looking at it, knowing what they need, and then bidding on it. And if you make it a competitive process, um, then oftentimes the bids are, are higher than that consulting forester's estimate. Um, that's just to give people a general ballpark, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't put constraints on what the bids can be. And uh, in my experience, I haven't sold timber on private lands, but I was a forester at Fort Knox in Kentucky before coming to Ohio. And uh, we had sealed bid lump sum sales all the time. And the range of those bids, um, I, I remember one sale, the, the lowest bid was 30,000. The highest bid was like 170,000. And we had estimated around 70,000 for the timber on that sale. So um, the forester is going to give an estimate, but it really comes up to the, down to the buyers and how bad they need it. Okay. Paul has a comment uh, expressing surprise that foresters are not required to be licensed in Ohio, which is the same as in New York. Yeah. In Ohio, most of our forest management's in Appalachian, Ohio. So it's uh, not a whole lot different than the rest of Appalachia. We're not, we're not super advanced on licensing and, and permitting and stuff. So that's all the questions, Dave. That was a great job. I, pre I, I, I really like some of your slides. I've got a, a similar kind of presentation I'm given in a couple months. I was taking notes on what I needed to, to add to my presentation. Yeah, so one comment on my last picture, there's the guess, a uh, little dendro question. Oh. I won't put you on the spot, but that's a bright red tree in the late in the summer, early fall, it has almost no timber value, but talk about another value for a landowner, and that's the beauty of that black gum, oh, which I'll produce, I, also produces some good. Uh, I was gonna uh, guess black gum, Dave. Yeah, I didn't wanna put you on the spot. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> all right, thank you, Dave. Dave will be You're back again welcome. at seven o'clock tonight if you all wanna see it again. All right, thanks. So, thanks, Dave. Thank you all okay. for joining.